last week, it's truly a celebration, wasn't it? A celebration of what God has done the past 40 years at our church, the past 20 years at QPEM. We came together, both the KM and the EM, two congregations as one family, right? One family to worship together. We're gonna, do, we're gonna be doing more of this stuff, uh, I promise you that. We're gonna have more of these joint, truly joint bilingual services in the future. Uh, Reverend Kim and I, we've been talking, uh, we're, we're thinking uh, possibly quarterly, uh, at least maybe four times a year to do this, to get together uh, with, with the KM and EM and really have just a one family worship. I think we need to do that more. Uh, bridging the cultures at our church, for we are one church, one family. And I've heard some amazing feedback this past week from the KM especially about uh, just uh, our, our QPAM uh, uh, members uh, that were there, and, and especially um, Deacon Dave had a wonderful prayer for us uh, last Sunday during the service. And, and uh, wow, what can we say about Deacon Shimon's testimony, right? We heard that last week here. He, he blessed us with his testimony uh, at QPAM. It's an emotional testimony. He poured out his heart to us. Uh, I love this so much that I put uh, Deacon Shimon's testimony back in the bulletin here if you look at it right after my sermon. Now that's a, a typo, so he's not going to come back up here for another testimony. Uh, I rest assured, I didn't want to get him too scared. But uh, he went and, and shared his testimony in the KM side last Sunday as well. And I'm telling you, they, they told me this past week that, uh, especially the Kwon Sunnians, the, the elders, they were saying it was one of the most powerful testimonies they've ever heard. Uh, ever on the KM side. Can you believe that? Of all the 40 years of speakers and all the different people that they had, I've even heard some of the KMers, they want to invite Deacon Shimon back just to maybe be a revival speaker. I'm serious, I'm serious. I heard that. They want Deacon Shimon back to be a revival. It's just a power and, and just that, 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 that emotion and just a genuine just, just truth about God, right? Uh, what God has been doing. Uh, they were really blessed by that. Uh, uh, what a blessing uh, uh, that was to share with the KM. And then uh, we showed the video, right? The video that Rumi put together, just a, it was a wonderful uh, a reminder of QPEM's uh, uh, 20 years, and, and we put the Korean subtitles in there uh, with that. And in case you missed it, in case you were away last Sunday, uh, the video, the QPEM, uh, the, the look back 20 years of QPEM is on our Facebook page, okay? Did you know that? We had a Facebook page of QPEM. Just go to Facebook, type in uh, QPEM or Queens Presbyterian English Ministry and you'll find us. Uh, we have, I think right now, almost 80 likes, okay? So we're almost there at the 100 mark. So hey, a couple more of you, we'll break that 100 mark to, uh, to really uh, break that century. But go there this week if you want to and take a look at the video. Um, Rumi, again, just doing a tremendous job with Pixels. Uh, uh, just leading the multimedia ministry. If you uh, have any interest in that, it's an exciting time to join. We're, we're actually going to be launching a brand new QPEM website. I'm hoping by, by Easter. It, it's in the works. By Easter, uh, I hope that by then you'll, you'll be able to log on, www.qpem.org, and, and you'll see a brand new state-of-the-art, contemporary, fresh a website that's going to have all the uh, announcements, uh, details, our sermons will be uploaded there, and multimedia pictures. It's going to be a resource I hope that all of you will be able to go to every week in case you want to find out what's happening at QPEM and for visitors and newcomers as well. Uh, exciting times there. She put together again the, the QPEM video, Look Back, right? That's what we did. Last week we looked back at God's faithfulness, His perfect record with us, how He's been leading us every step of the way thus far. I was sharing to the Wednesday prayer group this past week, especially to the men, uh, that uh, after Sunday, I was feeling pretty good, I gotta admit. I was feeling pretty good. The, the anniversary service went well. You know, great testimonies, a video. I looked at QPAM, and, 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 and I really feel right now, I believe that we're heading in the right direction. God's leading us. Our members are committing to grow in faith, and, and we're having the most number of QPAMers come out to Bible studies ever in our history. We're having the most number of QPAMers coming out to prayer nights. We're having most number of people coming to small groups every month, college and young adults, most number of students coming out on Fridays, and, and just members committing to personal worship, devotions, quiet times, scripture memorization, so many members coming for Kairos Festival, fellowship, community, there's a lot of exciting things right now. You notice that? A lot of exciting things going on at QPAM. We're growing together in community. I, I'm telling you, I was feeling good about this. I was feeling good last Sunday. For some reason, though, I had a thought Sunday night when I got back home. You know, just to kind of uh, take a deep breath. Uh, now just relax for a little bit. I had a sense that I think things were going a little maybe too well here. You ever think about that? You ever, you ever experienced that? Things are just going so great. I kind of have this thought, this, this, this weird feeling that maybe is it going too smoothly? 
Because what I've come to realize in my life, for sure, and at and church, whenever things go too smoothly, it's surely a sign of something's to come. Something's going to come. I really believe that. When things go too smooth or too well in life, I really believe this, one of two things are going to happen. Either one, God's going to bring a test to that situation. He's going to bring a test or a challenge, a trial. Why? Because it's to test our faith, right? To continue to mature and grow our faith, right? Into maturity, complete maturity. It says in James 1, right? It's a test that comes in life. Or a second thing happens. When things are going so well, when God's doing his work here at church, you better believe someone else is not too happy about that. Right? When God's doing his faithful work at QPEM and KPCQ, you better believe there's someone else who is going to do everything he can to stop the work that's going on here. That's the enemy, right? That's the enemy. That's Satan, we know that. And he's going to try to bring temptations, right? Temptations, distractions, challenges, try to bring us down, right? And that's how it is in our spiritual lives, church. Something's going to happen. Something's going to give. And for whatever reason, this past Sunday, I can't, I don't know why, but I, I just felt something not good. I, I felt something was going to happen. I thought about Caleb, my little boy Caleb, my little baby Caleb. He's, he's 14 months old now. Finally, after, you know, months of this dreadful winter, he was finally healthy. He's, he's, he's getting back now. He's, he's eating well again. Uh, he's not coughing or he's not, you know, no more you know, sickness. He's finally getting back to himself. And I just thought to myself, what if something happens to Caleb here? What if something's going to happen to him? I tried to quickly dis dismiss that thought. I was like, ah, come on. It's just, no, that's foolish. It's foolish. Stop, stop thinking those things, right? I went to bed, but I'm telling you, right that night, around 2 a.m. in the morning, he, he gets up. And he starts very, being very, very distressed, upset. And, and I start to feel his head. It gets a little warm. I'm like, oh, boy. Monday morning, sure enough, he has a 101 fever. He's broken. He's, he's just literally sick. He's just, he just doesn't want to eat anymore. He's cranky. He's crying. I was like, oh, boy. Are you serious? I don't know. He's sick again. I stayed home with him on, on, on that Monday. Try to just, just play with him. He wouldn't eat much or whatnot. And so I'll try to play with him. I, I, I gave him this toy here. I brought this little prop with me today. I brought this little um, toy, and, and I gave it to him while I'm trying to feed him, right? It's one of his favorite toys. Caleb loves, like, technology. He loves, you know, touching buttons and pressing anything inside, right? He loves to play with uh, my phone, and uh, I'm afraid <laughs> he's going to break it eventually. But he, he, he loves pressing buttons. And I gave it to him, and, and I, was, I was kind of feeding him. He, he, he pressed uh, this button here. Let me turn this on, actually. Hello. He turned this, he pressed this button. Six. Then he pressed another button. Today's game is Panic Cake. Yay. So he pressed the button. Six. And then he pressed it. Six. And then he pressed another button. Six. Wait, hold on a second. What did he just do? I said, Caleb, okay, 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 hold Press another button here. Press another button here. Come on. Give me a seven. Give me a couple of sevens here. I'm telling you, that's all he did. That's all he did. He literally just stopped right there. And I felt to myself, what is that all about, right? What is going on here? What's going on around this place in this kitchen of ours? <laughs> hey, it's funny. It can be coincidence. It's a reminder to me, though, that there's an enemy at work here. This is real. There's a spiritual battle going on here. It's an enemy at work in this world, church. And God's doing so much in our lives. And it's a reminder, even through this little prop here, that Satan is not happy. And he's going to do everything he possibly can to bring us down. I know it. He's not happy with where God's taken us this past 40 years and the 40 years to come. And no doubt about it, church, Satan is going to attack. He will. He has. At least this week for Caleb, it's been a rough week. Oh, man, he's, he's fever for four straight days, took him to the doctors, and so nothing we can do for him. And then uh, we looked it up, Kathy and I did, and he has something, a virus called roseola or something like that, and, and it's, it broke up into rash, and like this, this whole body's covered with rashes now. His face is like blotchy and all that, and he, didn't come to, he couldn't come to church today. He didn't want to you know, spread, spread it anywhere to the other kids. So Kathy's home with uh, Caleb today, just resting up. He's hopefully feeling better, recovering. 
Things are happening. It's been a rough week, not just for Caleb or myself, but it's been a rough week for a lot of us here at Kipem. I know a lot of you are going through a lot of challenges in life, real, serious challenges, hardships. We're under attack. We better know how to respond. We better know how to respond because the attack is here or will surely come, no doubt. Today, we're going to look at how we are to respond when the enemy attacks. Today, we're going to see very simply how Jesus responds, how he responds. And by seeing how he responds, we're going to see where the battle takes place. Through his example that he sets forth, we're going to learn what we must do to get through and conquer life's greatest tests and challenges and, and, and obstacles to our faith. We've got to respond. We better be ready to know how to respond to these attacks. Turn with me. Matthew 26, verse 30. Follow along with me. Matthew ch chapter 26, verse 30. It's right after the Lord, Last Supper here. Right after the Last Supper, Jesus is being betrayed there by Judas. Jesus and his disciples, he go to the Mount of Olives there. And here we see something that disciples do that we do all the time. See, like we just said, when things are going well, things are going smooth now in ministry, they're, they're feeling confident. We tend to get overconfident, don't we, right? Especially in our spiritual walk, right? Things are going great. Ministry's growing here, not just in number, but spiritually. As leaders, as members, we get comfortable, start to feel good about ourselves, and then we get a bit overconfident, and that's when Satan attacks. Look what happens here in verse 31. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on your academy, it is written. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replies here, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answers, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Look at what the disciples are saying. Oh, you talk about confidence, it's right here, isn't it? They're determined not to fail Jesus. Oh, they are absolutely determined. Some of us could say they're even maybe a bit arrogant to, to that point, right? I will never disown you, Peter says. Remember, but it's interesting. It's, Peter's not the only one that said this. You know, Peter gets a bad rap, I think, all the time. He's always the one that's focused on, ah, oh, this Peter, Peter, this, uh, three, denied Jesus three times. I like Peter. You know, I name myself after Peter because I like Peter. Right? He's a good guy. Uh, but he gets a bad, bad break here. Look what it says. All the disciples said the same here. It's not just Peter. All of them committing. Never deny you, Lord. Who of us here? <laughs> hasn't made a commitment like that before in our lives. Even this morning worship, maybe, right before service, we're singing songs, Heart of Worship, one of the most beautiful, just pure songs written by uh, Matt Redman, right? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. It's all about you. It's all for you. Songs like, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. I give you all my worship. I give you all my praise. But you alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, these songs we sing, these words that flow from the lips of our mouth, I am so very mindful when I sing these prayer songs. We have to be very much aware of what we are professing there when we're singing these songs, don't we? Here in these moments of praise, we're promising to God, making these vows, commitments. Lord, it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Or is it? Is it truly? Is that really true? I'm not saying don't make these commitments to God, you know. Jesus, yeah, we, we need to do that. What I'm saying is when we're making these vows, we don't realize what we're saying sometimes. We don't realize just how vulnerable we are. How vulnerable we are to Satan's attacks. See? We don't realize what we're committing here, what we're saying. I give you all my heart. Every breath I take, Lord. Every moment, have your way. <laughs> Do you understand what we're saying? 
It just takes a simple attack, a small attack from saying something to go wrong in our lives. We don't get the job that we wanted. Oh, we're so disappointed. We just can't get that dream job. We fail a class and we lose our, our financial aid and now we're done for the semester. We get into a heated argument with our spouse and now things are just, just kind of rough at home or our best friends, we disagree with them and now we have a broken friendship there. God forbid a loved one gets sick. Really sick. Next thing you know, these promises, these commitments, these vows we've made, these allegiance I've sworn to Jesus, I will never disown you, never disobey you, Father. They're replaced now by doubts and fears, anxiety, worry, anger, and sin starts to creep up into our hearts. That's what happens. That's what happens in our lives. Huh? What are we to do when we're under attack? What are we to do? <laughs> when we're so stressed and worried about life, when we're being so overwhelmed and consumed by this world, look at what Jesus does. Right after the disciples make their bold and courageous vows to him, their declaration of their commitment, look at what Jesus does right after in this passage, verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Sit here while I go over there and pray. If you're familiar with this passage, you know what's taking place here, right? Jesus is taking his disciples. Uh, in particular, he's taking three disciples, his, his inner circle, you can say, the closest people that, uh, that he has in, in his life right now, Peter, James, and John. He takes them to Gethsemane, the garden, to do one thing. To do one thing, he says, it's to pray. Right? It's to pray. Jesus had a reason to pray, right? In verse 37, we see that Jesus, he began to be sorrowful and troubled, it says here. It's not just a sadness here, or Jesus is not just worried about just, you know, just little things in life. No, it says in verse 38, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death here. This is the greatest distress of sorrow that we can possibly envision on this earth here. His soul is overwhelmed even to the point of sorrow, to the point of death. This, this verb here, deeply sorrow, deeply troubled, deeply distressed. It only appears only one other place in, in Scripture. It's in Philippians 2.26. It, it talks about the intensity of this word, distressed. He is troubled, deeply troubled, Jesus is here. It's as if he's opening his heart to all the pain that's lying ahead of him, right? That's lying just ahead. So he says to the disciples at the end of verse 38, Stay here and keep Watch with me, Jesus says. Jesus is saying, stay here, pray with me. Pray with me. Let's pray together, pray with me. When life's greatest tests, when life's greatest challenges comes, when we're faced with doubts, anxieties, and fears, when the enemy attacks, Jesus says, pray with me. Pray. We're to be driven to prayer. Prayer is to be the battlefield. Prayer is the battlefield where victory is going to be won or lost, church. Where victory is either won or lost, the battlefield, Jesus clearly says, it's in prayer. Because Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves, right? He knows the weaknesses in our flesh. He says to his disciples, pray with me. We get this. We understand this. We think we want to do it. When, what ends up happening, though, most of, most of the time with us is what we see happening with the disciples here. Right? Verse 40, we see what happens. Jesus returns after praying, and he finds them sleeping. Right? They're knocked out. They're sleeping. They fall asleep. His closest three people on earth, his inner circle, in the time of Jesus' greatest distress, they are sleeping. Every time I see these uh, sleeping disciples in this passage, in my mind, I think of two things. How could you do this? How could you sleep and leave your Jesus behind like that? How can you fail in that? And then I realized, I, I would have slept too. <laughs> Surely all of us would have slept just the same. So he says to them, could you men not keep watch with me just for even one hour? Can you not pray with me just for one hour in the time of greatest distress? The commentator says that Jesus here, he's obviously, he's obviously praying, right? He's praying, but he actually interrupts his own prayer that he's been praying to God to, to go to his disciples here, you see? He breaks his own prayer with God to, to go back to his disciples because he knows they're struggling. 
They're obviously knocked out sleeping. And he knows they're going to undergo a, a trial themselves. Oh, you better believe it, right? So out of love for them, he returns to his disciples. And just as he knew it, they're sleeping, right? So Jesus says in verse 41, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Look closely here. It's a very important verse. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The, the ESV, the better translation says, the, the flesh, our, ble our body, our, the flesh, it is weak, Jesus says. It's not just referring, Jesus is just referring to the weakness of our physical body. Yes, of course, uh, you know, it is weak too. And the disciples probably just tired and weary from all that. Uh, I get that. But, but he, he's pointing more so not just to the physical weakness, but, 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 but to our humanity, to our morality, right? The disciples made it clear. They were, they were excited, right? They were saying, right, we're going to go with you all the way to the end, Jesus. There's the spirits. We're sincere and deeply loyal to, to Christ. We'll never deny you, they said. But they hadn't reckoned the weakness of their flesh here, you see. They don't realize how vulnerable they are in their flesh. It's the weakness of our flesh that brings down the very best intentions that we have to follow Christ, you see. All of us, we have good intentions, you know. I want to follow you to, 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 to the end, but I'm telling you, the weakness of our flesh, it, it brings us down to failure time and time again. Most of us know what it's like. <laughs> Right? When, 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 our, when our, our spirit is stronger than our body, right? When the spirit is willing, but the, but the body, the flesh is weak, and especially for those of us in our 30s, maybe 40s, 50s here, you know, we're not how we used to be, right, in our 20s, right, in our teens, right? athletically or physically, right? You know, on Tuesday nights, we have uh, uh, this, this basketball night, uh, the sports fellowship ministry uh, uh, right here at church. It's a privilege, actually, for QPEM members. It's, a, it's just for QPEM members to come and just play ball together, just grow in community and fellowship together. We've had just great turnouts there on Tuesday nights, and I, I, I've been trying to play every week, so I, I, I want to play so bad. Things come up, and, but one time, I, a couple of months ago, I, I was able to go and play. I laced them up. I, I, I bought brand new basketball shoes. I was so excited. You know, I haven't played ball in like, like a decade, so I, I got excited. I got into the game, and, and here I am with, with, with the, these college students and young adults, and they're running circles around me. I'm like, wait, hey, what happened to my quickness? I, I was pretty quick back in the day, but wow, they're running circles, and the next thing you know, I, I'm having trouble breathing out there. I really, I, I'm, I'm kind of hyperventilating. I'm like, I, I, break, break, stop, stop, stop. Coming. Next thing you know, I'm done. I, I'm out. After like one game, <laughs> I think uh, I was sore for like a whole week, right? My body was aching the whole week afterwards. And it's not the same that we used to be, right, physically. We want to do it. Our spirit's willing, but the, our body's weak. And some of you are planning to do that Spartan race, that, that crazy Spartan race or whatever in, 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 in the June or whatnot. Uh, be wise. Be wise, I implore you. And if you're in your 30s or 40s, you know, your spirit's willing, but the body's weak, right? Just, just listen to your body there, right? That's what Jesus is telling us here. Jesus is telling us the spirit is willing. Yes, he gets that. But the flesh, it's real. It's weak here. And he says, because of that, watch and pray here so that you will not fall into temptation. Can't you see? He's saying you can't do it on your own. You cannot do it. None of us can. That's why we're supposed to pray. That's why he says to pray to the one that will help us do it. The one who will enable us to do it, you see? Otherwise, it's very clear what's going to happen. You will fall into temptation. Make no mistake about it. It's not an if, oh, you know, if, if I don't pray, then maybe I'll fall into temptation. No, if we're not praying, we will fall into temptation here. Not a single one of us is, 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 is strong enough to, to resist that. I promise you that. When these attacks come, these attacks come, Satan's going to come with all these temptations that, that he knows you struggle with. He's going to do whatever he can to bring you down, to, to make you doubt about God. He's going to try to overwhelm your life with fear, anxiety, worry. He's going to fill your minds with lies, and, and he's going to try to distort God's truth. He's going to tell you that no one knows you better than yourself, you see? Come on, you, you got to do it on your own. He's going to have to tell you, he's telling you, you're the one that has to get yourself out of this mess. You have to be your own savior. Satan's lies to us. And to that, Jesus says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Don't even think about it. 
Don't even think about doing it on your own because you can't do it. I'm telling you, you'll fall into temptation. It's the only way. You gotta pray. Pray, pray a submissive prayer. Pray the prayer that Jesus prays here. Pray that, that deep, genuine, honest prayer to God. We're gonna talk more a little bit about Jesus' prayer, get a little deeper into that next time. But today, we see here, in Jesus' greatest time of distress here, right before the cross, in the prayer of Gethsemane, Jesus goes to the battlefield, and that battlefield here is prayer, church. That's where he takes his disciples, to the battlefield of prayer. Why? Because that's where the battles fought, that's why. That's where the battles are fought. And if we're not on the battlefield here, and if we're not on the ba- if we're on the sidelines, we're on the sidelines, we're just watching maybe, oh, oh, we'll let the pastors pray. We'll let maybe some of the deacons pray for me. You know, they're doing, you know, my, my, my parents pray for me every day here at church. You know, they go to heaven. You know, I got enough people praying for me. If you're not on the battlefield yourself, your battle might as well be lost. Because Jesus is saying very clearly, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Look what he says in verse 43. Jesus is praying again, and he comes back. He comes back, and again, what does he do? He finds them sleeping. His eyes are heavy. So he goes back again, leaves them again for the third time, goes right back to the battlefield, starts praying on his knees. He comes back in verse 45. And then he returns to his disciples and says, Are you still sleeping and resting? Are you kidding me? Are you still sleeping? Look, the hour is near. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. See what just happened here? See what just happened? The disciples, they've been losing the battle, okay? They're not on the battlefield. They've been praying. They've been sleeping and resting just off in their dreamland. They've been losing the battle, and the enemy's attacking. The enemy's about to attack. Jesus knows what he needs to do, right? He prays the most intense prayer that we could possibly ever imagine, right? A prayer that, 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 that sweats tears of blood, right? Blood that is being sweat from his brow. Right? He's wrestling and struggling in prayer. Satan is tormenting him here. But through prayer, Jesus' heart and mind is given to the Father right there right there in prayer, right here at the prayer of Gethsemane, and right here, I really believe, victory is one church, right here, through prayer. Yes, of course, ultimately, the cross, that's the victory. Ultimately, victory is won at the cross, but I believe right here, the battle is won first through prayer, right here. And after that, it's, 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 it's done. It's done, victory's there. Jesus says, rise up, let's go. Come on, we're ready. Here comes my betrayer. Let's go. Victory's done. Oswald Chambers says this. He says, prayer does not prepare us for battle. So often we think that, right? We're going to go into battle. We've got to pray. Let's get together. Let's get to pray. He says, prayer does not prepare us for battle. Prayer is the battle. Prayer itself is the battle. That's what we see here. Do we get that? Do we understand that? Do you understand how important prayer is here? Look at what God's doing here at QPEM. Look at what God's doing. Congregations, uh, seats are filling up here. Who knows, soon enough, maybe uh, we'll hit 200. We may not be able to all worship here together at one time. Who knows? God's growing the ministry here. Exciting things happening. You know when, I, when it really began, I think, at least... When, since I've gone here. You know when I, I really believe things have started to change here at QPEM? I really believe it all happened in October 2011. October 19, 2011 to be exact. Anyone can guess what, what happened that day? What do you think happened that day? October 19, 2011, about two and a half years ago. There you go. Because you were there, Deacon Dave, you were there. First day we started, we started back again, Wednesday night prayer at QPEM. I'll be honest, I had my doubts. I did. I did. You know, we're talking, you know, Deacon Dave and I were like, All right, how many chairs should we put up here in a circle? I said, well, let's, let's start with five, right? I mean, you, you me, I know Deacon Rubin's going to be here, so at least we, you know, we could do five. Deacon Dave's like, come on, man, let's get a little more ambitious than that. And we put about ten, ten chairs up here. 
Starter Foods about maybe 12 members that came out. It didn't work before at QPEN for some whatever reason. Previous pastors, I know they tried Wednesday night prayer. They tried it for two weeks, I heard. No one came, and so they gave up, and, and it was done. That's it. It didn't work. Can't do it at QPEN. Can't do it for English ministries. Can't do it for English-speaking congregations. Second generation, they don't, they're not going to come out on a Wednesday night in the middle of a week to pray. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, the KM, they can come out all the, all the time, even in the mornings to pray. That's just not EMers. It's not going to happen. So, so, so stop dreaming that. Well, it happened. Now with this past week, we have consistent almost 30, 40 members every week. Every week. This past Wednesday, actually, it was a historic Wednesday for Wednesday night. I believe it, this is historic. It's the first Wednesday night prayer ever at QPEM where there were more women than men at Wednesday night. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay. More women came out this past Wednesday to pray than men did. I remember, like I said, I keep joking around. When we first started, literally, it was like 15 men, the deacons, and then Deacon Una. That was it. Okay? <laughs> so it was 15 men and what, one woman there. And now the women outnumbering the men almost. Wow. Things are happening. Prayer. Our praise team, I, I hear they're committing to prayer. Even last night, the praise team got together. Every member of the praise team, now the praise team is getting pretty big, isn't it? Have you noticed that? They're, getting, they're growing in number. I think almost like what? what like how many members are on praise team now? 14 members, right? 14 members. 14 members with all these different schedules and, and busy lives, and students and young adults and jobs and whatnot. Well, they come out to prayer every month now. They, come, they go to Daniel and Sarah's home every month, Saturday night, once a month, to pray together. Pray together for the, for the ministry, for worship, for our church, our leaders. Every month they've committed to that. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine that? Things are happening because of prayer, church. Everything that we see around us is happening because of prayer. Everything that is happening here at QPAM, growing in number, spiritual uh, just fervor and passion and desire for the word and worship, everything is attributed, I believe, to prayer because God's the one that's doing it, not us. God's the one that's driving all this. We can't take any credit for this, church. I really believe it. It's happening through prayer. It has to happen through prayer. Because that's our battlefield church. It's coming up. We have many opportunities for prayer coming up. This Wednesday, it marks the start of Lent season, right? It's not just a Catholic thing. You know, a lot of Protestant evangelical churches are, are really uh, uh, committing to the, the Lent season. What is that? It's 40 days. Starting this Wednesday, it's, it's, they call it Ash Wednesday. Wednesday to 40 days leading up to the Saturday before Easter. It's a time of commitment. It's a time of, of prayer, of repentance, uh, focusing on our need for God's grace. It's really time to prepare ourselves for the celebration that's ahead, right? On Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the life that we have and we, we hope for as Christians, that's what we're doing. It's all leading up to that, to prepare our hearts for the celebration. That's what this Lent season is. Our church begins the 40 day to, days of Lent prayer on March the 10th in one week. In one week, a 40 day street, our church is going to get together on the main sanctuary. 6 a.m., 6 a.m., to pray together. It's not easy, but that's what we're going to commit to do. QPEM last year, for the very first time ever, we began our first ever early morning prayer ourselves, right? Again, people said, oh, you got to be crazy. EMers, fine, they might come on Wednesday nights, you know, in the evening, but morning, 6 a.m.? You, you got to be kidding. They're, they're not, they're, we're all night hours here, right? We're not morning people except maybe Dick and Shimon, right? We're, we're, all, we're all night hours here. Well, hey, last year, first time ever, Passion Week. From, from Palm Sunday to, uh, to Easter Sunday, we had a 6 a.m. Uh, early morning prayer at QPEM. People came. People came. So this year, we're going to uh, double it. We're going to try something uh, a little bit more aggressive. We're going to make it two weeks this year, okay? We're going to make it two weeks, okay? So the two weeks leading up to Easter, we'll have our own separate uh, early morning prayer to prepare ourselves for Easter, okay? So we're going to encourage you. Get ready for that. Okay? I encourage you all, come, up, come out for that. Start your day and prepare for Easter Sunday that way. Lent prayer is coming up. This Wednesday, Wednesday night, praise and prayer. Praise and prayer. What an awesome time just to worship freely. What a wonderful praise team we have, church. What a wonderful praise team God's blessed us with. 
They're going to lead us in an extended time of worship. We're going to turn, turn all the lights down. That's what we do on Wednesday nights. We turn on the lights down. It's kind of like a retreat feel, almost like a revival. Turn the lights down. We, we praise for like almost 40 minutes straight. And then we pray. We pray for about uh, 45 minutes okay? straight. I love Wednesday night praise and prayer. Come out. Come out for that. Come out for the battle. Because the battle is happening, church, and it takes place on the battlefield. And it takes place on the prayer field. That's where victory is won or lost. What are you going to do? How will you respond? The great preacher Haddon Robinson, he said this. He said this about this passage that we just studied today. Haddon Robinson, he says, Where was it that Jesus sweat where, that Jesus sweat great drops of blood. Where was it that Jesus sweat great drops of blood? Not in Pilate's hall, nor on his way to Golgotha. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. See? Had I been there and witnessed that struggle, I would have worried about the future. If he was so broken up when all he was doing is praying, I might have said, what will he do when he faces a real crisis? Why can't he approach this ordeal with the calm confidence of his three sleeping friends there on the side? Yet when the test came, Jesus walked to the cross with courage. And his three friends fell apart and fell away, you see. It's because of prayer, church. Get that? When the test came, when the ultimate test came, Jesus had victory on the cross. He had victory where the disciples failed. Why? Because victory came through prayer. That's why, church. A former professor of mine at Trinity, Dr. Lee Eklov, he says this. Many of us Christians, we don't realize just how incompetent we are, how vulnerable we are to these profound spiritual failures that are just facing us, that are waiting us, all these attacks. We don't realize how vulnerable we are to that. And you believe no story in Scripture sens sensitizes us more to this fact than this, test, this text that we studied today here, the story of Jesus' extraordinary and costly victory in the Garden of Gethsemane and the extraordinary failure of his disciples in that same dark hour. You see the contrast there, church? The ultimate victory in Christ through prayer and the failure through the disciples' lack of prayer. Right here in this moment, many of us here are going to go through, are going through challenging, hard times. You're going through a test like you've never faced before. I know it because you've talked to me about it. I've been praying with you about it. You're going through a very time of stress, discouragement, worrying about your families maybe, about your finances, your relationships, your futures. It consumes us. It gets us worried. What did Jesus do in this time of distress? He went to pray. That's what he did. He went to pray. In times of distress, church, we must go to God in prayer. There's no other way. There's no other way. What will you do? What will we do? How will we respond? This is the battlefield that we face. There's no other battlefield there is than prayer. This is it. If we're not on the battlefield, we are losing this battle. That's it. We're losing it. You're on the losing side. I encourage you today. Get on the battlefield. Let's get on the battlefield here. Everyone, come on now. Let's get on the battlefield. Challenge each other. Let's, let's start praying. Attack's coming. Attack has probably has already come. Trials, temptations, tribulations, they come. Come on the battlefield. Get ready here, church. Get ready for the 40 days of Lent coming up. Get ready. Commit to it. Commit to Wednesday night prayer. Let's be victorious this year through prayer. Join with us as we go to the battlefield. That's where God's going to meet us there. And that's where he's going to continue to lead us these next 40 years. Let's go to him in prayer. Let's pray. We're praying for a heart of prayer. Give us, Father, a spirit of prayer. Give us the will to deny our flesh because we can't do it on our own, Father. Uh, yes, the spirit is willing, but we're weak. That's why we need you, Father. Give us the strength to commit to you in prayer.